marketing department. Uh, right out of the gates, we've placed a link in the chat for to get feedback from you. It's our feedback form. Uh, and we really appreciate hearing what everyone and reading what everyone has to say about the programs that we do. So we'll motion to it again at the end of the program. Uh, I'm going to blast through some quick housekeeping and intro stuff because we do have a very large number of books we'd like to share with you today. So first thing first, we've got our chat available. It's the best place to reach us if you're having any technical issues or if you have any questions. And as well, just as in our in-person programs, uh, we ask that you be mindful and respectful of everyone here. All right. So I would like to start by acknowledging that we are gathered and I'm coming joining you all today from the unceded territories and homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. As a settler who lives and works and plays on this land, I acknowledge the land in the spirit of reconciliation and, I re and to reflect on the ongoing cultural genocide that has taken place across this country. One of the first steps towards reconciliation is to acknowledge the land, and to learn about why it is so important to do so. Uh, there are many resources to learn about land acknowledgements, how to do one, why to do one, as well as to learn about specific treaties or to discover the land whose land you are on. We encourage everyone to take that journey and open up conversations with family and friends about the rich heritage that has existed since time immemorial in this country. Um, there is another link in the chat for some Vancouver Public Library resources to help you with that journey. All right. Also, if I'm speaking too fast for anyone, if my language is too quick, please just raise your hand at any point and that goes for all of our speakers and we can slow down a bit. I'm just too excited. Um, so let's think, start things off with a quick agenda of what today is going to look like. Uh, first, I will give you an introduction to Accessible Services, the department that I work in, and a introduction to our literary engagement team, which are the other colleagues that I'm working with today. It's the department they work in. And then we're going to each explore a sort of subgenre of disability representation in literature, uh, first with fiction featuring disabled characters with disabilities fiction written by an author with a disability, nonfiction books about disability topics, creative nonfiction such as memoirs or biographies. And once we've talked about all of our titles, my colleague Jana is going to give a really lovely overview of a couple of Vancouver Public Library resources for picking what book you might want to read next. If you liked something, how do you pick what the next book is going to be? So she's going to show you a couple of resources like Novelist and books just for you. And then we'll give you a quick, uh, just a quick plug for some of our future programs. So a lot to cover and I hope it's fun. I hope it's gonna be great. Okay, so I work in accessible services. We are a department that supports 400, over 400 patrons through our home service delivery model and through our uh, collection for people with perceptual disabilities. Home delivery service is available to anyone, any Vancouver resident who is unable to physically come to a branch for a period longer than three months. And our collection for people with perceptual disabilities is mostly consists of audiobooks on MP3 format for ease of use, as well as a small collection of daisy readers, which are for people with perceptual disabilities or low vision. And uh, so if you, if you can think of anyone in your life who might benefit from these services, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can find us at vpl.ca slash accessible. And my lovely colleagues from the literary engagement team, they do such cool work. It's the only reason I get to be here today. Um, they do, they put on programs and facilitate events that deliver, that celebrate writers and readers. They aim to foster a meaningful dialogue and embrace and amplify diverse voices. The work they do aims to reach an audience of adults, seniors, and intergenerational mem community members from a broad range of communities and ways of being. Today's program is going to sort of embrace the work that they do, as well as the work that we do in accessible services, and bring to the forefront some great books that we think can help 
raise awareness for disabled writer, writers with disabilities and uh, characters with disabilities. So maybe we will just get it started with Jonna, right? Hello, everybody. Um, I'm so uh, grateful and honored to be here today um, to meet up with Connectra and, of course, to work with Georgia, the wonderful uh, in ASV or Accessible Services. Um, yeah, so uh, in the course of this sort of journey, I was covering fiction featuring characters with a disability. Um, there is a lot out there, and uh, it was really fun for me to explore. It was sort of my first foray into the genre, and um, I'm very happy to report that I found some really excellent titles uh, for you to explore, too, if you are a fiction reader. Uh, so just one moment while I get up my notes here. <laughs> so... The first book that I tackled is called Good Kings and Bad Kings. This one's actually a little bit older. It was written in 2012 by Susan Nussbaum. Um, it was the winner of the Penn Bellwether Prize for Socially Engaged Fiction. Um, and I'm gonna pop a link into the chat uh, about that prize. But essentially, um, this is the sort of the write-up about what they say about this prize. So it's, it's a good one to kind of follow if you're interested in finding more work uh, that, um, talks about socially engaged fiction. So it explains that socially engaged fiction may describe categorical human transgressions in a way that compels readers to examine their own pre prejudices. It may invoke the necessity for economic and social justice for a particular ethnic or social group, or it may explicitly examine movements that have brought social, uh, brought upon positive social change. Uh, so this fantastic book uh, takes place in an institution for juveniles with disabilities. Uh, it has been written from multiple different viewpoints um, with a first person uh, point of view. Um, and it, it includes the young people with disabilities who live in the home, staff who work there, and a recruiter who works for the industry. Um, because it does take place in Chicago in the States, um, and the system there is a little bit different. It's more privately run. Um, um, and it kind of shows, it really exposed me to the reality of the people who are in those situations. Um, one character is actually modeled after the author herself, who began using a wheelchair after being hit by a car at the age of 24, and soon became quite a prolific and integral part of Chicago's burgeoning disability rights scene. Uh, so researching Susan Nussbaum is also uh, quite, quite the deep dive you can take and the work that she did in her life. Uh, this book really uncovers the horrors, um, sometimes with humor, of forced inst institutionalization in the U.S. And I'd like to read just a very short excerpt um, that sort of I found to be very quite mind opening uh, for me. Um, and this uh, takes place, it's from the point of uh, view of the character of Joanne Madsen, who is the only disabled staff person at the institution. Uh, she does data entry for the institution and she's reviewing the case file of one of the residents, a boy named Pierre, who has been in the system since he was found on the streets at the age of five. He was diagnosed with cerebral palsy, rickets, ADHD, PTSD, and ODD. So, I googled ODD and it's, well, it's got a lot of behaviors listed. And the problem with looking any health condition up online is you get lots of words and scary acronyms that give you only a tiny sliver of true understanding about a particular human being. I looked at my own disability once and it scared the crap out of me. I could hardly recognize my own experience. Some of the technical descriptions were totally creepy and they had no relationship to my real life. I think doctors use the worst case scenarios in order to be published in my opinion. Um, so yeah, once again, this was sort of my first foray into the world of literature that features characters with disabilities, but it certainly won't be my last. I found it to be totally mind opening. Uh, it exposed me to the genre and to these people. Um, and this novel in particular uh, serves an excellent starting point for allies to begin the journey of understanding the realities of the disability community and the rights that they're so frequently denied. Uh, so that was Good Kings, Bad Kings, a novel by Susan Nussbaum. 
that was kind of my longest talk. I'll, I'll speed through the rest of them so that we could get to everybody today. Um, the next one I read, this one was pretty hot off the presses. It's called We Are Inevitable. It's by Gail Foreman. Um, this one is listed as a YA uh, fiction. YA is for young adults, but really it's quite readable for everybody. Um, often when um, YA does it, does feature characters who are of a younger age, uh, but I think that the lessons that are learned are, are uh, across the ages. Um, in this book, we meet Aaron Stein, who is a flawed yet lovable young man who's struggling with the recent loss of his brother. Uh, this prompts him to question the inevitable. Grief, change, life, moving on, they're all inevitable. These inevitabilities can either be good or bad, and Foreman's book shows that it's all about perspective. Aaron learns from his new friend, Chad, an incredibly optimistic character who, be who became a paraplegic 10 years previous while cliff jumping. Um, Chad, although a secondary character in the novel, is an effervescent and supportive person who jumps off the page and is truly the very best part of the book. Uh, Chad's experience as a person living with a disability is authentic. And truly, I would say he's the driving force for the action and the change that occurs in the novel. Um, it's also a love letter to bookstores and music. Um, so if you like either of those things, if you like books and if you like music, this is a really good book for you. It's got so many uh, great shout outs. And it even comes with a bibliography in the back of uh, the more than... 50 titles that are mentioned in passing throughout the book. Uh, so it's it was quite lovely. Um, it's also a deftly drawn portrait of the ripples of addiction. Uh, Aaron Stein, the main character, his brother had uh, died of addiction um, and it, it really hit hard, especially uh, living in our city, which is grappling with some of the same issues. Uh, it also takes place in the Pacific Northwest and they uh, do go on a road trip to Vancouver. I always love to see uh, local surroundings uh, in a book, uh, so that's kind of fun. Um, but the last thing I'll say about it is that Aaron's reckoning with grief is a very slow burn and very real. And the cycle of addiction is rendered with care and precision. Uh, so it's got a lot that it packs into this sort of YA package, uh, but we are inevitable. It's a beautifully illustrated um, cover. Um, it's not illustrated on the inside, but uh, the outside, it's got that classic Gail Foreman. If anybody's read anything by Gail Foreman, um, the sort of readability, it's a real page turner. I whipped through it in uh, probably two days, and I loved it. So moving on to the next title. Uh, this one is Get a Life, Chloe Brown. So this one is also hot off the presses. Um, this is by Talia Hibbert, and it focuses on the life of Chloe Brown, a young woman who suffers from fib fibromyalgia and chronic pain. As she's attempting to navigate independence from her family, she finds love along the way. Uh, so it's definitely firmly in that romance genre. Um, I would definitely classify it as a summer read. It's super readable. It's really fun. Um, and it's also quite eye-opening uh, because it features an unseen disability and explains the struggles and successes that Chloe has as she navigates the world around her as a person living with chronic pain. And as an example, I'd like to read you just a very small ex excerpt um, that really demonstrated to me what it was like to have chronic uh, pain. Uh, this is from uh, an earlier part of the book, but uh, Chloe is talking about her sister and their sort of relationship. Um, and essentially, she her sister has asked her to go out way too late at night, and she says, no, she, her pajamas are on, she's ready for bed. And her sister says, at half past eight, Eve's enthusiasm faltered, replaced by hesitant concern. You're not having a spell, are you? Chloe softened at the question. No, love. Most people had trouble accepting the fact that Chloe was ill. Fibromyalgia and chronic pain were invisible afflictions, so they were easy to dismiss. Eve was healthy, so she would never feel Chloe's bone-deep exhaustion, her agonizing headaches, or the shooting pains in her joints, the fevers, the confusion, the countless side effects that came from countless medications. But Eve didn't need to feel all of that to have empathy. She didn't need to see Chloe's tears or pain to believe her sister struggled sometimes. Neither, for that matter, did Danny. They understood. So that was just a brief excerpt from um, this really lovable uh, read, Get a Life, Chloe Brown. It was also uh, 
fairly new. I think it was published uh, in 2022. Uh, so you can get your copy by following the link in the chat. Uh, we also have it available in, in lots of different uh, ways. If you're looking at the chat, you will see uh, that we have listed uh, whether a book is uh, available in uh, proper book form, uh, in large print, as an ebook, or also as a downloadable audiobook, as this book is. Okay, so moving on to the Oracle Code. This one is for all the graphic novel fans out there. Uh, it is a graphic novel. It's beautifully illustrated. You probably can't see quite so well, uh, but it is classic graphic novel form format, and it actually takes place in the DC universe. Uh, so if any of you are DC universe fans, or you've got a young person in your life who's really into comics, uh, this would be the graphic novel for you. Um, after Gunshot leaves teenage Barbara Gordon, who if many of you savvy might know, uh, is the daughter of Gotham's favorite, Commissioner Gordon. Um, she is paralyzed below the waist and she undergoes uh, physical and mental rehabilitation at the Arkham Center for Independence. Uh, she has to learn how to adapt to a new normal, but she cannot shake the feeling that something is dangerously amiss. Between strange sounds at night and the patients mysteriously missing, it's up to Barbara to put the pieces together and solve the mysteries behind the walls at Arkham. Um, some of the fun things that I really liked about this book were that um, it illustrates sort of a training uh, for a person who is uh, newly um, uh, disabled. Uh, so there's like wheelchair chair training where Barbara is learning how to use her wheelchair, how to go up ramps, how to do sort of some tricks, go through obstacle courses. It even illustrates um, dodgeball games and basketball games. And truly, it was quite empowering um, for people with disabilities. The, the characters that are in throughout the rest of the graphic novel are all uh, quite, quite empowered um, and able and and ready to do things. We watch Barbara learn to live in her wheelchair and adapt to her new reality, all while she solves a mystery about the shady center she finds herself in. Um, so yeah, I do think it was it's a fantastic graphic novel. Uh, it's a really good starting point if you've got a reticent reader or somebody who doesn't really care to read very much um, in their life. Graphic novels are a really accessible uh, way to get into reading. Um, I've got one last title to tell you about. I might actually squeeze in two. Um, this one is called Accessing the Future. Now, this is a fantastic disability-themed speculative fiction anth anthology. So speculative fiction is a little bit more like sci-fi. Uh, so if any of you are, are big fans of that genre, this is a really great one for you. This is told uh, from all sorts of different uh, viewpoints. Um, a lot of the authors in the book are people with disabilities, um, and the characters inside of the uh, short stories are also uh, have disabilities. Um, so this one has got 15 different authors and nine artists that have collaborated together to bring this science fiction stories of disability and mental illness into the future. Um, it was actually a crowdfunded uh, book, which I think is really fantastic. Um, it's really professional rate, like it's got great pages, it's really nice to hold, beautiful illustrations. Um, and each of the 15 stories deal with some aspect or aspects about what it means to identify as disabled and how the experience of being disabled impacts the ways a person moves in and interacts with the larger world. The eight illustrations in cover art tell stories of their own in order to further open up the anthology to people who are better able to engage with and think about disability through pictures than words. There's a little bit of something for everybody. Um, and this one was edited by Catherine Allen and Jabril El Ayad. Um, my favorite story of the collection is actually the first story that I read, and it's called Pirate Songs by Nicolette. Barishoff. Um, it's essentially kind of like a Robin Hood space story. I loved it. It had space pirates. Um, this group of space pirates loots a fancy ship that had been floating in deep space. Um, they come back with one comatose survivor. Um, it turns out that that pretty girl who uh, was the comatose survivor um, has spina bifida. 
So in her own words, she says, that means I'm missing a spine. Um, and we see what her life is like uh, without the use of her wheelchair, which was, of course, left uh, aboard the other ship. Um, she was also quite wealthy. Uh, so she had grown accustomed to living a life with these sort of robotic servants. Um, and she was quite accustomed to a life uh, where she was not having to do things for herself. So we see sort of an arc where she's discovering that. Um, we see how her ide idealistic spirit and plucky identity transcend her disability. Uh, she wins over the pirate captain. And essentially, I think she might end up saving the world, although it is a really short story, so it doesn't go that deep. Um, yeah, the very last one I'll tell you, but I don't Unfortunately, we're not going to have this in the chat, but uh, do note the title. It's called The Right Way to Be Crippled and Naked. This one is um, the fiction of disability. So once again, it is an anthology that was written um, by folks with disabilities um, about their disability. So this one is also really great to check, check out. Um, it's got tons and tons of stories in it and uh, really nice uh, profiles on the authors. So if you're looking for some reads that are fiction, featuring characters with a disability. Look no further, we've got you. Thanks everybody. All right, I'll jump in. Um, I'm just reading the chat. I see uh, Allison has mentioned in there uh, Amanda LeDuc. So uh, I will reply to you right now with a yes. We, uh, I'm gonna talk about her book. Maybe I'll start with it uh, since we're on the topic, but um, Amanda LeDuc is a Canadian writer, uh, both fiction and nonfiction. I have her fiction title here um, as I'm covering fiction written by an author with a disability today. Uh, Amanda lives with cerebral palsy. And of course, as you've seen in the chat, uh, in addition to her work as an author, uh, she works as the communications and development coordinator for the F Festival of Literary Diversity, uh, which is Canada's first festival for diverse authors and stories. Uh, so Amanda's nonfiction work examines the ableism uh, embedded in traditional fairy tales and reimagines fairy tales to include uh, happily ever after uh, for everyone regardless of their ability. Um, and that book was called uh, Disfigured. It was shortlisted for the 2020 Governor General's Award in nonfiction. Um, and then her interest uh, in fairy tales really comes through in The Centaur's Wife, uh, which was published in 2021. Uh, in this story, the world has nearly ended. Meteors have destroyed the city that our main character, Heather, lives in with her family uh, and humanity's facing extinction. And there's only a handful of survivors, including Heather and her husband and their newborn twin daughters. Um, there's a mountain that looms over the city uh, that becomes the survivor's focus uh, as it remains lush and green and full of life while the rest of the world uh, is perishing. And Heather is one of the few people who knows how to get out there uh, and what mythical creatures they'll encounter once they arrive. Um, so I found the descriptive language in this novel to be really beautiful and immersive. And Amanda, with her storytelling, she really questions that voice of authority that comes with traditional fairy tale uh, narration. So that kind of third person omniscient narrator um, with fairy tales, you go into them as a reader, kind of uh, understanding that kind of like wild things are going to happen. Uh, and because of this authority given to, to the narrator, uh, from the reader's perspective, there's no need to in interrogate the landscape and kind of say like, mm, this doesn't really make sense. And I think this suspension of disbelief, uh, Amanda says, you live in this land where foxes talk and people accept uh, that there's a suspension of disbelief. And I think what Amanda does is really powerful, where she kind of challenges the reader to think about, well, you know, if we can accept things like talking animals, why can't we accept a hero or a main character with a disability? Um, so with this story, she really gives us something that looks like a fairy tale, um, but that really liberates characters with a disability to be something other than the villain or, you know, the unlucky one who never gets the happily ever after. The second book I read was called So Lucky by Nicola Griffith. Uh, that one's here. It's really short. It's a short read. It's quick. I just blasted through it. Uh, it was so wonderful. Um, Nicola is a dual U.S. and U.K. citizen. She immigrated to the U.S. in 1989. Uh, she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 1993, and she's been writing fiction since the 90s. Uh, she writes across a bunch of different genres. Some like this one are more in like the thriller, kind of suspense, horror arena. She also writes a lot of fantasy. 
Um, Nicola is a queer woman. She's been proudly out since the 90s. So that's uh, queerness is a big theme in all of her books. And she's won so many awards, uh, two Washington State Book Awards, a Nebula, and six Lambda Literary Awards, uh, among others. In 2016, she began the hashtag CryptLit uh, on Twitter, uh, aiming to create online community for uh, disabled writers. And So Lucky is her second most recent book, and this one draws on her own lived experience with multiple sclerosis. And I found it to be a really unique book because it combines this autobiographical fiction genre with elements of suspense and thriller. Um, themes of ableism are prevalent, uh, and if someone reading this without the lived experience of having a disability or chronic illness, it really immerses you in what it's like to experience that like awkwardness from people around you who don't really know how to talk to you about your disability uh, to the realities of, of real oppression, kind of like navigating the medical system. Um, and this is an American book, so it's uh, mostly focused on the American medical system um, and things like, you know, once you uh, become a person with a disability, you notice how uh, inaccessible buildings are around you, things like this. Um, so as I said before, it's really short, it's really fast paced. Um, and Nicola does that on purpose. She says, fiction allowed me to compress time and intensify the experience for the protagonist and the reader. I built a narrative structure that helps the reader experience ableism, its internalization and eventual deconstruction by accelerating the course of the main character, Mara's multiple sclerosis. So the novel takes place over just the course of a single year. And when we meet Mara, she's a woman on top of her world. She's never met a challenge she couldn't deal with uh, until in the space of a single week, she is diagnosed with MS, gets divorced by her wife, loses her job. And then she also becomes, uh, she begins being stalked by a shadowy figure whose intentions are unclear and leaves Mara feeling unsettled and afraid. Um, and so this, since this was her second most recent book, I thought I'd also just quickly mention her most recent book, uh, which she goes back to one of her other genres, uh, which is fantasy, and it's called Spear. Um, I don't have it in the notes, but I can pop it in here. There we go. Um, so this one's a queer retelling of the medieval tale of Percival and the Holy Grail, and it's been called a queer Arthurian masterpiece for the modern age. So I haven't managed to get my hands on that one just yet because it's so new, but uh, I think it's going to be good. Next, I will talk about uh, the author Sarah Novich. So she is an American author of the New York Times bestseller and Reese's book club title True Biz, uh, which just came out last year. And then also the novel Girl at War. This one's her debut novel from 2015. It won the American Library Association Award uh, and was long listed for a couple others. Uh, Sarah is a deaf rights activist who's written about the, challenge, the challenges that she's faced as a deaf novelist. She's an instructor of creative writing and of deaf studies, and she lives in Philadelphia with her family. Uh, girl at War follows an 11-year-old girl named Anna, who's living through the beginning of the Yugoslavian War in the early 1990s, uh, and follows her as she flees to North America. And the novel moves back and forth th through time uh, into Anna's adulthood, early adulthood, uh, in the early 2000s in New York City, and follows her as she returns to Croatia as an adult uh, to search for lost friends and pieces of her old life. Um, it's a really kind of heartbreaking coming of age and war story. Uh, but it's really captivating and beautiful and it's kind of based on true history so I thought it'd be good for anyone that likes that either historical genre historical fiction genre or the kind of like based on a true story uh, type reads and I don't have Sarah's most recent book True Biz because there is a really long holds list on it at the library so this is a New York Times bestseller and it's part of Reese's book club picks um, it's called True Biz which is an ASL American Sign Language term that means like real talk or like I'm going to be real with you uh, it's a novel that will appeal to both adult and teen audiences, and it follows a year of romantic, political, and familial shifts for a teacher and her students at a school called the River Valley School for the Deaf. And I think Novich's characters seem like, I've been reading some reviews um, because I haven't read the book yet, I'm just mostly leaning on reviews, but it seems like her characters are what really shines in this book. So there's Charlie, who's a rebellious transfer student who's never met another deaf person before. Uh, we've got Austin, who's the school's kind of golden boy, uh, whose world is really rocked when his baby sister is born hearing. 
And uh, we've got the headmistress of the school named February. Um, she is a hearing person. Uh, she's the child of deaf adults. And she, the focus of her in the story is that she's really fighting to keep the school open. There's a threat of closure. And she's also trying to keep her marriage intact, but it appears that she might not be able to do both. Um, so this book has been recommended for anyone who loved the 2022 Oscar winning, Oscar winning film Coda. Uh, it's a moving story of sign language and lip reading, disability and civil rights, isolation, injustice, first love and loss, and above all, great persistence and joy. Um, and yeah, very popular. I'm really excited to finally read it. And I will finish with a book for kids. Um, this one's called We Move Together. Um, it's so colorful uh, and wonderful. It's written by three authors. Uh, one of them is Kelly Fritsch. Uh, she's a disabled writer, parent, and educator, uh, an associate professor at Carleton University in the sociology department. And she co-wrote this with her uh, friend, Anne McGuire, who's also a uh, a professor. She teaches disability studies uh, and about disabled childhoods. And then it's uh, illustrated by Eduardo Treos, who is a Costa Rican multidisciplinary artist and parent. Uh, and this is like a really beautiful collaborative work um, celebrating difference and diversity in all its forms with a message of belonging uh, and curiosity. And it's all grounded within disability justice activism. And so I found uh, the illustrations are just really diverse and give positive represent representation to so many different ways of being. I'm just going to open it to a page that I really liked. Um, hopefully it's not too blurry on here. Um, but I just love that there's so many different representations of people of different ages and genders and abilities. Uh, I can see this being a really joyful book to share with especially kids who exist at these intersections of different marginalized identities. So kids who are queer, gender diverse and disabled or kids who are racialized and disabled who may like rarely see themselves represented in media, let alone in a positive light, uh, in a joyful light. And then also getting to see adults that look like themselves uh, as role models. And I think that this book uh, has a really wide range of age appropriateness. So the pages are really big and colorful and illustration forward. There's maybe like one or two sentences on each page. Um, and the stories are really being told through the illustrations, which uh, range in complexity and detail. So, you know, younger kids might look at the page and see like nice colors and basic details like, oh, a wheelchair uh, or different skin colors. And then as children age, they might notice more uh, intimate details, such as like, oh, those people are using American Sign Language or that person has a breathing apparatus or that person's wearing a headscarf. So I think uh, I love that about it. And then at the end, I mean, these are uh, university professors after all. So they've given us this really wonderful multi-page section of breaking down each spread throughout the book. So I think there's probably, you know, 15 different spreads all set in different places with different things happening. Um, and then this section at the end kind of breaks down academic concepts into a really accessible uh, digestible format with keywords bolded, uh, suggestions for further reading for our teachers or adults, uh, parents, guardians, um, and, you know, introducing you to, to uh, different concepts and different figures um, within the disability justice movement. Uh, so those are my picks today. Uh, thanks for listening. I will pass it over to Nicole next. Great. Hello, everyone. I'm Nicole. Um, really happy to be here and to be sharing some of these great reads. And like my colleagues have been saying, once you start reading, you find so much amazing stuff out there. So it was it was hard to narrow it down to a few. Um, but I am I am um, sharing today some nonfiction books on disability topics. And so the first one I wanted to share with you today is called Disability Visibility: First Person Stories from the Twenty First Century. And it's a really great anthology um, edited by Alice Wong. So if some of you may know, Alice Wong is the creator of the Disability Visibility Project. And I'm just gonna put a link here to the website in the chat. Um, it's an online community that's dedicated to creating, sharing and amplifying um, disability, 
disability media and culture. And so Alice's work really re revolves around this idea of storytelling as a powerful tool for creating community and for fostering agency. And so all of her work really advocates for sharing of individuals lived experiences as a way for people with disabilities to really take back control of a narrative. Um, so this project that I put the link to the website in the chat, it actually started off in 2014 as a one year project. Um, so the goal was to encourage people to share the stories of their lives. And Alice's uh, role was to have those stories recorded and then they would be archived in the Library of Congress. But it's been almost 10 years and she's just kept this project going through this website and it's really expanded to include um, a lot of writing. So some of the authors from this anthology are writing on the website, but it also includes um, tons of interviews. She has free plain language versions of her books on the website. She's got a podcast that I think she's done up to uh, about 100 different episodes of. She's got art curated on there. It's just a very, very great resource. And so this, this anthology, I think, is a very faithful kind of representation in book form of what the project is doing um, online. And it includes about, I think there are about 40 different authors um, included in this anthology. And what I love about it is it's really, really broad in topics and uh, very diverse in authors. And another great thing that I'm a fan of too is that a lot of the writings are quite short. So you can read it cover to cover, or you can just open it up and read a couple of short bits when you've got time. Um, and it's very kind of exploratory in form. So there's some poetry in there. There's some kind of first person narrative. It goes, it goes quite broad. Um, so she really kind of focuses on topics that include embodied experiences and identity. And then she also moves through collecting works on ways of learning and being, and from action and advocacy to transcending isolation through disability justice work. So there are writings on a lot of topics such as parenting with a disability, uh, navigating with a guide dog, the erasure of indigenous communities in the context of chronic illness, and learning how to survive the climate crisis from the work of disabled queer and trans communities of color. And the book has a really great, really thorough bibliography at the end too. So if you're enjoying the writings in here and you're looking for some more suggestions, it's quite extensive and it also includes a lot of different types of media. So it includes poetry, it includes art, digital media suggestions as well. So it's a great jumping off point for finding your next great read. Um, and I wanted to mention too, that there is, and I don't have it with me, but there is a young adult version of this book as well. So she's adapted it into another edition. And that includes um, different authors and different writings on topics that are more aligned with young adults. And she also just has a memoir that came out this year called Year of the Tiger. Actually, I think it came out 2022. So it's still quite new and it's quite popular and well-received. So if you're a fan, you've got a lot of reading to do with Alice Wong. So the next title I wanted to share with everybody is, and you may have heard of it recently in some media, it's called Crip Up the Kitchen, Tools, Tips, and Recipes for the Disabled Cook. And it's by Jules Charette. And it's just come out this year, 2023. And Jules Charette is a gender non-conforming, autistic, disabled, trans man, and a food photographer and stylist, writer, journalist, and activist from Duncan, BC. So a local author as well. Crip Up the Kitchen is both a guide and a cookbook. So it kind of functions in, in both ways. And it really focuses on bringing the economy and satisfaction of home cooking to disabled and neurodivergent cooks. And Jules has been speaking a lot lately um, in interviews and online about his inspiration for this book, which really comes from the relief that he found um, through getting an Instapot pressure cooker. So that was a new, a new discovery for Jules. Um, and he also does indoor gardening with an arrow garden. And so realizing that both of these things gave him a lot of relief and satisfaction, he started looking for resources um, for ways he could incorporate that into his kitchen at home. Um, and he's been documenting his experiences on his blog as well, which is called disabledkitchenandgarden.ca. And when he was having trouble finding resources written by disabled people on how to create a disability-friendly kitchen and garden, he decided to really kind of take things into his own hands and 
really write his own book and build up his own blog um, to put that information out into the community. And so that's kind of where the inspiration for his book comes from. And right in the beginning, the author uh, speaks to the term crip up or cripping as a way to disrupt ableism and to signal a taking back of power and a centering of disabled voices. And in terms of the kitchen, which Jules, the author, says is the most ableist room in the house, this means using key tools and strategies for making the kitchen an accessible and enjoyable space for all aspiring cooks. So Jules really focuses on the use of three key tools, which are the pressure cookers, that's the Instapot pressure cooker, um, an air fryer, and a bread machine. And he uses those tools to create 50 really awesome recipes that are organized according to the effort involved. So he uses the spoon kind of metaphor for indicating how much effort something may take. So a recipe may be indicated as being worth one spoon all the way up to all your spoons. And so the spoon is a metaphor for the amount of stored energy you have available to you to really work on a recipe. And he's got everything in there from chili to like lemon loaf and butter chicken and shortbread and it's really great. Um, the photography is amazing. Let's see if I can find, well, even if you just see the back cover there, I don't know, it's, it's that kind of food photography that's really tantalizing and beautiful and he's done the phot photographs as well. And he also shares tips and strategies for not only just cooking, but for how to prep your meals, how to take care of your pantry and organize it in a way that's efficient for you, and how to shop efficiently as well for people with differing physical abilities and energy levels. And he also talks about cooking and canning safely when, when disabled and for how to prepare your freezer um, and pantry for post-surgery. So it's a really comprehensive book that's not only just recipes, but it's a lot of guidance, resources, and helpful links and places to go from there. So it's a great one. My next title I wanted to share with you is just a quick one. It's a little tiny book, and I'll do this one really quick because it's super tiny. It is called A Quick and Easy Guide to Sex and Disability. So if you can see the cover there, and it's by author A. Andrews, and it's a graphic novel. So I thought that was a great uh, format to share. We don't often see a lot of uh, nonfiction graphic novels. Um, and A. Andrews is a queer and disabled web cartoonist, and they're best known for their web comic, Oh Hey, It's Alyssa. So it's great to have a, a graphic novel on the list. And this one really provides a positive, inclusive, and comprehensive guide to disability-friendly sex. And it's a quick, fun, and funny read. So it aims to introduce and talk about real ways of talking about and having more enjoyable sex for people with disabilities. So it does focus on physical accessibility needs and considerations. Um, but the writing style is really light and reassuring, and it's really an underrepresented topic. So I thought it's a great one to kind of introduce people to this topic. Um, and if you really like it, uh, it is part of a series that talks about other topics as well. I think it's called, it's just the Quick and Easy series. So there are about four or five others in this series um, on topics like they, them pronouns, consent, and queer and trans identities. So it's a great fun light read is a good one. Okay, I'll quickly, I know we're running out of time, but I really, there's so many great ones to share. I just wanted to do this one and I'll do this one a bit quicker because this one is a brand new one by an author um, that is also lived in Canada, but currently lives in Seattle and they're very well known in the disability community. Their name is Leia Lakshmi Piepsa Samarasina. And the title is The Future is Disabled, Prophecies, Love Notes, and Warning Songs. And Leah is a queer, non-binary, femme, disabled writer, performance artist, and transformative justice activist currently residing in Seattle. And I just thought this book is really topical right now. It touches on kind of the current state of events in the world, um, just with COVID and with a lot of political upheaval going on. And she really does a fantastic job of framing what feels at times to be a really grim present and a really grim future. And she does this in a very hopeful and creative way, imagining a world where we can all kind of come together and learn from each other and move towards hope, action, and community. And so the two, the two key questions I think that this book really frames really well are, what if in the near future, the majority of people will be disabled? And what if that's not a bad thing? And what if disability justice and disabled wisdom are crucial to creating a future in which it's possible to survive fascism, climate change, and pandemics, and to bring about liberation? So uh, the author is really asserting that 
Disabled people, and especially BIPOC and queer disabled people, have been caring for each other for a long time, keeping each other alive and fighting for justice. And they have so much valuable experience and wisdom to share when it comes to transcending isolation, like we saw with COVID and making community. And I just wanted to share a quick quote from the author about um, their motivation for writing this book. And they state that disabled people already know a lot about making isolation survivable or even fun through virtual events, sharing food, mailing masks to each other, checking in to make sure people are okay, problem solving, and showing up when people are sick. I wanted to write about how we were showing up. So that's really kind of, um, I think, what's underlining her work in this book. And she talks about topics like care tactics, mutual aid, disabled community building, and disabled art practices as survival and joy. <clears throat> and now I'm running out of time, so I'll just hold up this one really quick and show you Rolling Warrior, which is a great, great read uh, for kids. And this is a youth version, I guess, um, edition of Judith Human's memoir. And Judith Human was an important uh, disability rights activist from the 1960s until I think she only um, passed away just very recently. And she fought for accessibility in schools and equal rights for people with disabilities because she was denied a public school education as a child due to her use of a wheelchair for mobility. She was denied a teaching certificate and as she just went on to become very politically active and she led the longest sit-in in American history in the 1970s. And she developed a lot of legislation in the United States and with the UN and World Bank. And there are two editions. One is a picture book version and one is a kind of an older middle grade kids version. And they're just both great books for kids in your lives. So I will end on that, but thank you for letting me share these great books with you. Oh my goodness. How do I follow all these incredible titles? Thank you to my colleagues from the literary engagement team. This is why you are the professionals in this group. Um, I'm going to talk to you very quickly. Again, we're all conscious of time um, about the creative nonfiction genre and what falls under that umbrella. The first book I'm going to talk to you about is Sitting Pretty, The View from My Ordinary Resilient Disabled Body by Rebecca Tausig. Uh, Tausig was diagnosed with cancer that attacked her spine at the age of 14. The battle for her health left her cancer-free and paralyzed from the waist down. As a young person, she was always searching for representation of disabled, disability in the books she was reading and the things she was watching, and always felt quite disappointed by the lack of nuance and authenticity in these representations that she was seeing. Uh, this disappointment proved to be quite generative and resulted in her becoming a writer herself, as well as an activist for disability justice and rights. Um, this book, Sitting Pretty, uh, explores her own experiences living in the limitations of an able-bodied world, um, as well as uh, has some more essay-based forms that are calls to action for the com greater communities at large. I really enjoyed this book from the perspective of having something maybe a little bit more actionable or inspiring while reading a memoir, when you read about sort of the struggles that Tausig was living with and you're left with the question of, well, what do we do? She gives a lot of good advice on those sorts of ideas as well. It introduced me to her Instagram account, which is an incredible source of information and inspiration for those wanting to fight for disability justice and to create more equitable access in our world. So highly recommend as a sort of an introduction for allies who may not know as much as they, who would wanna know more, as well as for fans of a memoir, but also are looking to maybe do a bit more afterwards. Sitting pretty. I'm going to go through these fast. The next book I want to talk to you about takes on a bit more of an experimental form. This is Not Body by Eli Turek L. Bechelani Lynch. Uh, Not Body takes the form of poetry, essay, and creative nonfiction through letters and musings. Uh, what Turek L. Bechelani Lynch is doing in this book, I found very, very interesting. It's a very small book. It's only a hundred pages, but it stayed with me long after I finished reading it. There are many threads that can be pulled out from it. 
Uh, they talk a lot about the idea of luxury, both as a material object and as a source, as a form of privilege. I'll read you a quick quote of, when was the last time you had the luxury of forgetting your body? So that is some ways that uh, Al Bechelani Lynch confronts the ideas of capitalism and ableism in the world that we live in. As well, most of the essays and poems in the book deal with the idea of limits or limitation. And I found it quite interesting to read a book tackling that subject matter while also tackling the idea of the limitations of the traditional book form and playing with structure in that way. And finally, I really appreciated their ideas around representation. We've been talking a lot today about rep representation in books and in writing. And I think we often talk about representation in visual media and other forms of media, but uh, Tarek El Bechelani Lynch talks about representation in a much deeper way, saying that we are not just looking to be seen on TV. We are looking for our meds to be available and covered. We are looking to be believed. Uh, this book is evocative and intimate. It is very tender, but also is very effective and affecting. And I highly recommend it for fans of poetry or experimental literature or anyone who just appreciates a very deeply personal story. So Not Body by Eli Turek El Bechelani Lynch. Most of the books that I'm talking about today um, explore sort of a relational understanding of disability justice and disability rights. And all of them in some way talk about confronting the ableist world that we live in. And my next book is no exception. It is The Places I've Taken My Body by Molly McCulley Brown. Macaulay Brown is a poet and essayist, and she's also the creative writing director of the University of Wyoming, I believe. I could be wrong about that. Um, this book is a series of essays, as well as a in sort of the structure of a memoir, where she takes us on the journey of her life, talking about personal uh, experiences traveling and through her understanding of religion, as well as some unique histories of her family. I'm not going to give any spoilers away on this one, but it was, there was some shocking stuff about her family. Um, but she also creates an interesting foil by then talking about greater issues facing the disabled community or disability representations in history. Um, some specific things she talks about are the American eugenics movement, or she also analyzes Mary Shelley's Frankenstein through the lens of disability. And so it's an interesting foil to have the personal and the much more general and how they play off of each other. I, I would recommend this book for, again, fans of memoir, but also for fans of narrative nonfiction, because I felt like the uh, segments that were about more general topics were very informative and very interesting as well. So highly recommend that. And then our last book, our last book for the whole program is Habin, The Deafblind Woman Who Conquered Harvard Law. This is a very traditional memoir um, telling the story of Habin Gurma, like the first deafblind woman to graduate from Harvard Law School. She's also become a very vocal disability advocate in her career and in her adult life. Uh, the book takes us on the journey of her education and her adulthood, but it also starts off with the first chapters being about her family life and her experiences in growing up Eritrean and the impacts of the Eritrean Ethiopian war and what that did to her family become and uh, they left Eritrea as refugees moving to America. Um, the big note, the most notable thing about this book for me was that it is incredibly joyful and positive and uplifting. Even when talking about heavy subject matter like accessibility, she is the goal is to inspire and to uplift and bring awareness to all different types of communities. When talking about her family's experiences with war, it was more rooted in 
familial love and cultural pride than in anything else. So I was struck time and time again while reading this about just by the sheer positivity that Gurma brings to her writing, the entire book is written in the present tense because Gurma says she always likes to live in the moment. And she was recognized by uh, President Barack Obama as being a, I can't remember what it's called, as being a champion of change. So someone to check out, very inspiring. And that is all I have for you. All right. Jonna, would you like to talk to us about some resources? Absolutely. We're going to speed through this really quickly, but if you do have further questions, you can always reach out to us. We're going to leave our contact information in the chat. Um, sometimes the website can be a little tricky to navigate, so uh, if you do need help, feel free to reach out to us. Um, yeah, let's go. I'm going to stop my share. Or Actually, one moment, please. I'm going to just show off the resources that we will be showing you. Uh, so today we're going to take you on a resource tour of two very fantastic resources available at vpl.ca. Uh, the first will be the Books Just For You service, which is actually a way that you can have VPL staff work for you to curate and create a perfect book list for you um, if you're looking for something new to read. The one I will speak to after that is a wonderful resource called Novelist. It's actually a database of uh, thousands of titles. It includes book discussion guides, author read alike um, and it makes searching really fun. I know I've gotten myself into some uh, placing holds trouble by uh, getting a little bit too excited over uh, novelists and learning about new authors. Uh, so I'm just going to stop the share briefly and then I'm just going to start the share again uh, so that we can visit the world's best website at www.vpl.ca. Uh, so once we find ourselves at vpl.ca, what you can do is head right over to the uh, borrowing tab. Once we're in the borrowing tab, you can find what do I read next. This is how you can find that great books for you service, um, as well as we've got tons and tons of VPL uh, the staff created and curated book lists. Uh, so the book lists are great. I think Leah's going to pop those into the chat for us, um, as well as sort of a link to get to the form. So the book's just for you. It actually, I'm not going to go through the whole process with you, but just to show you, it's actually just kind of a, a form that you will fill in with your information and your interests, and then staff will get back to you with a list of, of books that you might like to read. So it is really fantastic. It's also great. Um, if we, if you need to buy a gift for somebody, or if you're looking to expose somebody to books, um, this can be a really great way to find out. Uh, they, they'll ask you some questions about the audience, and you'll be able to tell them. Um, yes. So if we go back to vpl.ca, and I'll just go like that. Uh, the next resource I wanted to show you very quickly was our um, novelist. So. If we go over to the digital library tab and search for online resources under the research subheading, then we can just simply type in novelist, I think is probably the easiest, um, and it will pop right up. We've got two. One is novelist plus for kids and teens. So if you're looking specifically for children or young adults, that would be where you would want to head. Uh, but Today we're looking for adults, so we're just going to search there, and what it will do is it will pop up with this database. Now, if you've got a VPL uh, Vancouver Public Library card, this is uh, where you're going to log in using your credentials, so that's just going to be your library barcode. Um, and if you don't um, use the Vancouver Public Library, if you're not a member, um, your local library should probably have novelist. Uh, most um, British Columbia libraries within the system all agree that this is a very great resource. Uh, so once we have logged in successfully, then we will continue on to the resource. And essentially what we can do here is we can just search by a keyword. So if I'm looking specifically for books about disability, what I can do is just type in disability and it will search. Um, and then what is really pretty fun and extraordinary is that over on the left hand side of the screen we're able to see that we can tailor make who we want this book for. Uh, so I'm looking for adult 
books, and I'm going to look specifically for fiction titles. And um, you'll see it shows us every title from 1796 all the way up to 2023. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just maybe use that slider and get us some really current content. So we'll just look for stuff that happened from, say... 1999 to 2023. So that gives us 30 years of literature, pretty much. Um, and we can also search by all sorts of different uh, facets. So we can search by genre, theme, uh, character, storyline, all sorts of different things. Uh, today, I'll just go with those two, uh, changing it to adults, fiction, and between the 1999 to 2023. And you can see that now I've narrowed down that book. So I, I think there was 4,000 titles before. Now I've got just 960, which is a lot more reasonable when we're looking looking. Um, so you'll also notice here that there's these uh, title read-alike and as well as author read-alike. So this is really great because what we can do is we can actually look for books. If you're like, oh, I've read this book by Chris Mazza. I absolutely loved it. Then you can look for books that are like it. If we click title read-alikes, it will come up with a, a nice list of all of the different books that are very similar in content or theme uh, to the one that we had previously enjoyed. Um, so that's all I'm going to show you about novelists today. Uh, but if you do have any questions about it, you can feel free to reach out to the folks at Accessible Services or to our Information Services Department. Um, and we're just going to go back in and I think George is going to tell us about some upcoming events at VPL. Oh, you're muted, Georgia. I don't, I'm sorry for being muted for a moment there. Um, I'm just going to do this very quickly. Um, Vancouver Public Library always has just a ton of events happening all the time. We've highlighted three sort of different genres of events, if you will. We have, we're always doing things that are about literature and books. So one of our great programs is Story Stream, where you can have a story read out loud to you. That's happening on an ongoing basis. Um, also, we have a ton of events always happening around digital creation, learning how to use certain softwares, or um, for this one, it's about sound recording equipment and software. And then tons of classes and workshops. One that we are doing through Accessible Services is uh, in partnership with the CNIB, the Canadian National Institute of the Blind, uh, to help people with assisted technology. Uh, just check us out at vpl.ca slash events, and you'll see everything that we have going on. Or if you want something that's a little bit more specific to your interests, you can always reach out through email or through phone, and we can help you navigate that as well. Uh, and maybe we'll send it back to John. Do you want to finish us off for the day? Sure thing. I just want to say thank you to everyone for making us part of your day. Um, I do believe that this will be available on YouTube uh, in the future. You can also reach out to Connectra if you're looking for more exciting and informative library partnership programs. Um, and of course, we do. We put our program feedback form um, into the chat, uh, which is really helps us uh, at the library to be able to create engaging um, programming that you're interested in attending. Uh, so if you've got an idea for a program or you want to let us know how we did today or what we could have done better, please do feel free. Uh, you can also send us an email at info at vpl.ca. You'll be able to get in touch with all of us. And um, I thank you all very much for being a part of this fantastic partnership program. Thanks, everyone.